There are lots of cases in real life where the prisoner's dilemma comes into play. You can think about advertising wars when, when uh, and fare wars, for instance, when airlines decide to fight with each other to discount their prices all at the same time. Uh, OPEC co constantly fights with, with pressure uh, for people who want to cheat on the cartel. We can think about arms races, for instance, and, and uh, in cases of common property, there's an incentive for individuals to overuse common property when we would all be better off if people, can, if people conserved. Sometimes in the real world, we can get cooperation, and one way we get cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma, rather than uh, the more destructive outcomes, is because... It, it, we play the games over and over and over again. If Bonnie and Clyde are, can, are planning on committing more crimes, there are ways for them to build up trust, and there are Nash equilibrium outcomes in repeated versions of the game that will allow them to reach the cooperative outcome rather than uh, the, the destructive outcome where they both rat each other out. There are also many different games that don't work exactly like The Prisoner's Dilemma. The Prisoner's Dilemma is interesting in that it has a dominant strategy. We can see what each, uh, what each person wants to do regardless of what the other person chooses to do. The strategy of confess is always the best choice for Bonnie and always the best choice for Clyde. But not all games are like this. and Not all games have dominant strategies. Sometimes what you do depends on what the action of your competitors were. A note about oligopoly is that sometimes oligopolies lead to different, uh, lead to inefficient economic outcomes. And sometimes public policy can figure out ways to improve on the outcomes that we reach. There have been, uh, a, we, we have a very active antitrust department in the United States, and the antitrust department is in charge of enforcing laws to prevent destructive collusion. But it's important to note that it's not always wise to intervene in antitrust situations. One of the things that the Justice Department does is examine mergers and acquisitions and whether or not two firms uh, merging is really a sort of anti-competitive behavior, a way to make sure that uh, to bring collusive, uh, collusive incentives uh, inside of a firm at the detriment of consumers. But it's not always wise to intervene in antitrust situations. Sometimes when fir firms merge, they can, for instance, take advantage of economies of scale and l reduce production costs, which could benefit consumers. This is what companies often argue. It's also important to note that some competitive practices that, that might look like collusion can, in fact, be welfare-enhancing as well. We mentioned a moment ago that, that sometimes mergers that take advantage of economies of scale can be helpful. Uh, predatory pricing, often thought of as when firms lower their prices to try to drive out their competition, well, at least in the short run, consumers get lower prices. And so uh, predatory pricing can actually wind up being beneficial to consumers. Tying or bundling of different products may improve efficiency. If, if your cable company forces you to buy a number of things as a package, but perhaps this is a more efficient way uh, to produce things in some instances. And also resale price maintenance, the practice of making sure that your retailers uh, sell at a certain price, maintain a certain relatively high price. Sometimes this can protect product quality by ensuring that, uh, that the retail store won't skimp on uh, providing, say, customer service. Industrial organization. We reviewed several different kinds of market structures. We started with perfect competition, and then we examined monopoly, and today we've looked at monopolistically competitive market structures and oligopolistic market structures. And there are some important things to think about as we consider, uh, as we consider the distinctions and differences, both from a, uh, both from a, uh, a standpoint of what the market looks like and also a standpoint of how these market structures perform in terms of economic efficiency. The first thing is that along the continuum, per, we run from many firms in perfect competition to one firm in monopoly. In some, in some industries, we have free entry and exit, perfectly competitive and monopolistically competitive entry and exit. The distinction between perfect competition and monopolistic competition is, the, is that uh, with perfect competitors, they're selling identical or products that consumers perceive as identical products. In the long run, both, both of these kinds of competitive markets lead to zero profits. It may be the case that oligopolistic uh, industries lead to zero profits as well, uh, but that really depends on the, on the nature of the strategic games that they're playing. 
And monopoly, however, monopolists, because entry is restricted, can potentially maintain positive economic profits uh, for the long run. All firms, note, produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. This is the importance of thinking marginally. In equilibrium, firms set marginal revenue equal marginal cost. With the perfect competitor, they will produce where price equals marginal cost as well. But since monopolistic competitors and monopolies have downward sloping demand curves, then they wind up with price exceeding marginal revenue and so price exceeding marginal cost. What this means here is that monopolistic competitors and monopolists produce an inefficient quantity of output and produce above the bottom of their average cost curve. They produce with excess capacity and generate economic deadweight losses. The perfectly competitive market we mentioned has some nice efficiency profits. The firms are all uh, produced at the efficient scale, and the consumer and producer surplus total is maximized. That is, consumer and producer welfare, society welfare, is maximized at the long-run equilibrium in a perfectly competitive market.